Thank you. And I'm really using this as an opportunity to update um, you all and also for me to think about it. And I'll tell you why it's such an um, appropriate time to be thinking about meningococcal disease in so many ways. Um, so uh, I'm not going to cover everything, um, but I try to highlight important things that I think um, could be of use and of importance to you all. And so just one thing I wanted to highlight with these two pictures I have on my um, starting slide is that it's a diplococcus, it's this red little diplococcus here, and this is in a CSF specimen, so the case of meningitis, but to remind you that we're talking about meningococcal disease, so not just meningitis. In South Africa, of eye invasive disease, about 80% of it will be meningitis, but there are another 20, and sometimes it can be 30%, it depends, will be the bacteremia, your meningococcal sepsis which is also the most severe form. And I'll go through some case fatality ratios just to tell you. So remember not to call, just to talk about meningococcal meningitis, but really to remember that there is a proportion of disease that is not just going to be diagnosed from the CSF specimen and from um, diplococci on CSF. So I wanted to, I've taken some data that I think is an update um, and just reminding you of some of the features of meningococcal disease in South Africa. I'll talk a little bit about what's happened in the year of the pandemic, but I've especially tried not to have any COVID and SARS-CoV-2 slides so that I'm, I'm, I'm really trying hard not to talk about COVID too much. Um, and then some local data on meningococcal carriage um, from, a, from work done um, by a PhD student, um, Dr. Susan Mayroom, who's also quite an expert um, and helps us a lot within our um, team here at the NICD. And then some public health actions, just because I think it's an opportunity to remind ourselves um, what does it mean, um, what does meningococcal uh, disease mean um, from a public health action and what are we meant to be doing. So just to remind you, that's the diplococcus and I tried, to, that was a, the two little um, cocci together, making it a diplococca that you saw in the first slide. And it's important to remember that the polysaccharide stru structure that surrounds um, both of the cocci and the diplococcus is, um, is what the vaccines are based on. And in fact, a lot of the epidemiology I'll be talking about um, and disease overall in South Africa will talk about serogroups. And the serogroups are based on these polysaccharide capsules. And the six Zero groups here are really the most important of the 12 that are known. And you'll see that sometimes I don't even discuss some of the other zero groups simply because they're so rare. So just to remember these zero groups, and it'll come up again um, a bit later when we talk about vaccines, um, because the vaccines are based on these zero groups. And one thing just to remind you all um, that meningococcal disease is endemic throughout the world. Um, so in every country, um, there is meningococcal disease. Some countries detect it more than others. Um, and some of those issues might be related to the specimen taking practices. CSFs do get taken mostly by doctors, but blood cultures won't always. There will be empiric treatment. And I think this is important work that we've been doing in Africa, where we look at just what is happening with other countries other than the African meningitis belt related to meningococcal disease. And often the data are skewed by specimen taking practices. Um, and so, in some countries, they may only know about meningitis caused by meningococcal, by Neisseria meningitis. The other point that this slide is trying to make is to show you that the different serogroups. So here you have those six serogroups again, and you'll see in pie graphs, you'll see that these serogroups are prevalent at different proportions and percentages in different parts of the world. Again, there's no need to um, learn this off by heart or to know exactly what's happening because in fact it changes and it's very interesting it changes over time and so just to remember that um, depending on where you might be working if you do work um, in other parts of um, South Africa that things might be different to the province that you're working in and if you work in other parts of Africa or the world to remind yourself about meningococcal disease in those um, provinces those countries and those continents. One other aspect is just to remember that disease incidence is different um, depending on where you are and who you are to some extent. So this is a simplistic view and it only shows some details. Um, and it, it was in order to highlight that in the African meningitis belt, you have hyper endemic disease. So there the incidence rates are really massive, up to 100 to 1,000 per 100,000, which is nothing in comparison to South Africa. We're sort of here at the industrialized countries um, from our incidence rates point of view, and we have about one or even 0.5 per 100,000 rates of disease. 
Um, Hush pilgrims have a higher risk, and in fact, that's why, and this is no longer the case, so that's why it's um, it's um, obligatory for Hush pilgrims to receive the meningococcal vaccine, because they were recognized as having a higher risk and incidence rates were very high during the pilgrimages. Then freshmen in dormitories, that's our universities, those registering, and I'm mentioning this at this time, is they do have a higher rate of disease, um, the new ones, so the new um, university students that come from all over the country, sometimes even all over the world, that come for the first year and that live together in dormitories or are housed together um, and therefore have close contact. And it's the mixing of these new strains from different parts of the country, for example, in South Africa, that then re results in an increased risk of disease in these um, first year students who live in residences. Military recruits are very similar. They also come from different parts of the country or from the world, depending on where these military recruits are gathering, and they have also increased risks. And we are going to, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about data from South Africa related to university students. I do know that military recruits um, and police recruits in South Africa are also advised to have meningococcal vaccination. So this is why some of that um, happens is because we've identified that risk increases in these different um, populations. Um, and they are risk at risk populations more so than just the communities um, at large where we have risks of disease of about one per 100,000. A lot of these data that these risks are based on are on invasive disease. So when specimens are taken, um, and when we know people are admitted and are investigated for meningococcal disease, in some of the data that I present, and always to keep that in mind, is that there are un, um, there are those cases. So these are often underestimates of disease because those that die at home or die in residence and don't have specimens taken, we don't know that they died of meningococcal disease. And sometimes specimens aren't taken. So within South Africa, specimen taking practices vary considerably amongst different provinces and in different hospitals. So this is South African data just to show you why it's opportune to be talking about meningococcal disease now because it is truly a seasonal disease. So if you look, the periodicity is over time, the fact that it goes up and then down, and these are older data from 2003 to 2012. And within each year, so on the x-axis you'll see each year, you'll see that it goes up in the autumn and winter months and sometimes stays up in the spring months if it started a bit later and then comes down again. So in summer, over a year change, we'll have the least amount of disease um, in South Africa. So it's in fact at this time that we start to see an increase in disease in South Africa. And in fact, this was, has been shown historically. These are very much older data from 1940 to 1975. And you'll see even though there's waxing and waning of disease of meningococcal disease over time, each year there's a peak during the winter. And so that's quite classic for disease in South Africa that we have this increased um, disease in the winter and the spring, um, but we also see decreasing and increasing waxing and waning disease, so periodicity over a longer period of time. So here, this is another um, slightly more updated. So this goes to 2016 here. You'll see that overall, these are just number of cases in South Africa. You'll see that numbers are going down. And in fact, we're seeing if we go into, and I'm showing you updated data as well, you'll see that we have about 100 to 150 cases each year. But you yourselves know that each one of those cases, um, many of them carry stories and um, are very traumatic and dramatic for um, both the hospitals, the practitioners, as well as the families, as well as the media take those on quite um, considerably. So even though there are few cases they make, they, they are impactful um, in South Africa each year. What I wanted to highlight here is some of the serogroups. So we have serogroup A here in purple, um, B in yellow. These are two of the most important serogroups, and then serogroup Y in um, W in um, blue. And you'll see so that serogroup A faded away, and in fact, we have very few cases. And I just checked the data for 2020, 2019, 2018. We had no serogroup A cases um, identified in the country. So serogroup A has really disappeared, um, causing disease in South Africa. And that was long before the conjugate meningococcal A vaccine was used um, in the meningitis belt. 
Predominant is um, serogroup B and serogroup W in South Africa. And you'll see serogroup W played a much more important role it, when it peaked and when it caused quite a lot, and it was the predominant serogroup for many years over the period of 2005 to about 2010, but it's been decreasing steadily since then. And now it sort of is equal to serogroup B. So serogroup B and serogroup W are the two serogroups that are quite are the most important in South Africa causing most disease. And the other one serogroup that to keep in mind is serogroup Y in red. Um, and so those are the serogroups that cause disease. And you'll see that even in South Africa, we have this waxing waning of total disease, but we also have within that the changing serogroups as they come and go. So here just another, this is looking at the incidence rates and you can see here that overall the South African incidence, total incidence peaked at about 1.4. So you can see just how low that is in comparison when you look at the incidence rates of the meningitis belt of 100 per, per 1,000 per 100,000. And here we have 1.5 at the peak in 2006 when we really saw quite a lot of meningococcal disease. And you'll see this has been going down. And even more recently, we're down to less than 0.5 per 100,000 for total disease. And this differs then by serogroup. You saw serogroup A came down and is really not causing any or very little disease in South Africa. And it was serogroup W that went up causing most of the disease when we had this peak in 2006, but coming down. And now we have serogroup B and serogroup W sort of vying for the um, most prevalent serogroup each year. Um, as we look at the years after 2016. This is still older data from up to 2016, just to highlight which age groups meningococcal disease occurs in. This is South African data incidence, so you can compare these age groups and you'll see the most important age group, and this is for all serogroups, is children less than one year of age. You'll see that even for serogroup A, where we have so little disease, the peak is still highest for serogroup A here in the children. Um, and for all the other, the most important W here and serogroup B, they, it's the most important serogroup in this age group. We do see a little bit of an increase and that's classic for other countries. We don't always see it, but if we lump our data together, you'll see over these years, you have this increase in the 15 to 24 year old for this serogroup W, which was the, one of the most important serogroups during this time period and where younger adults become important again and have some increase in um, meningococcal disease. And it's thought to be because they are congregating and coming together. Um, and in different ways of looking at the data, we see this more clearly um, that these young adults may be at greater risk um, depending on which serogroups are prevalent and how we analyze the data and where they are. So one thing that's very important to, um, to remember is that in South Africa, we do see um, an association with HIV disease. So invasive uh, meningococcal disease is almost 2.5 times more often in HIV infected than uninfected individuals. And we'll look at this happens um, across the ages. There, it was, um, um, was significant and there was an increased relative risk. Yes, in the elderly, it almost straddled one, but it was most important in the 15 to 49 year old age group and overall, it was a 2.5 uh, um, relative risk um, for um, the increase in meningococcal disease in HIV infected individuals. And this is quite important. This has also been shown elsewhere in the world, in the United States and in Europe, they're starting to advocate for vaccination in HIV infected individuals. And you'll see that later when I discuss carriage, this also became important when we looked at carriage in university um, enrollees, so first year university students coming to universities in South Africa. So just to remember, um, and in some ways, um, the last, in these data, it was about 40% of invasive meningococcal disease where we had data on HIV were associated with HIV. And remember in the population generally, it should be about 10 to 15 to 16% um, um, overall. So it, it is significant um, and important to consider when looking um, or admitting patients, as well as thinking of in your clinical practice, um, who can we potentially prevent meningococcal disease in? So these are now updated data from 2019. Um, you'll see that only about 100 
and 11 cases overall. And this is where they had serogroup data and age was known. So um, we needed to have known data in order to show you these incidents by serogroup. And you'll see that it's very similar. You'll see that there's again this little some peak, and this is just for this that last year. Um, in the 10 to 14 year olds, and we think it might be in the 14, the slightly older children, that you see this increase here. And um, it was serogroup Y confirmed disease. And it may be, and we see that with these few numbers, that it just needs um, a camp or a school outing, um, a sports um, it, event where many schools come together and um, live together in communes or in residences for a year, for example. Um, some rugby um, um, tournament that continues for a week or so. Um, and you'll see that these are the individuals that then increase these rates in these older adolescents and young adults. Also very similar, I think you might have heard about an outbreak in, um, in a, a Scouts movement in Japan. The same idea, it's these young people coming together. In this case, it was inter an international um, event that occurred over uh, several days um, to a week and a half um, and many people coming together with different organisms that they carry in different meningococci who then share them um, and then um, are at risk of being exposed to a meningococcus that they no longer and um, that they've never seen before. So it still tells you that serogroup B is here is the most important and in fact in 2019 serogroup W had decreased quite considerably and the most important serogroup was serogroup B um, for the whole country. So these are the serogroups that are currently prevalent in South Africa and you'll see very different to those earlier data that I showed in from 20, um, um, 2013 to 2016. What do we know about the case fatality ratios? And this is now um, data again from that um, cohort um, when we were looking at data from 2003 to 2016, um, when we had in-hospital um, outcome data, and that would have been mostly for our enhanced surveillance sites. So only the biggest hospitals in South Africa that are part of our surveillance system, where we have surveillance officers collecting outcome data. And here you'll see that the overall, overall case fatality in hospital case fatality ratio was 17%. So this is when we knew what was happening in these individuals um, um, in hospital, when we didn't follow them up after they were discharged from hospital. And you'll see that it differs by serogroup. So for this time period, for serogroup W, um, where we also saw most disease, and it was partly associated with disease in HIV infected individuals, we had the highest um, case fatality ratio at about 22%, um, while serogroup C had the lowest at about 9%, and serogroup Y and B here um, at slightly higher, about 10 to um, 13%. So you'll see that the case fatality ratios differ by serogroup, and this will obviously differ and change as different serogroups move into the community, um, into South Africa, and then move out again, as well as the at-risk populations that change. Um, as more um, HIV-infected individuals hopefully become less at risk because of better treatment and better um, control, as well as prevention like HIV, very targeted HIV, um, or meningococcal vaccination, that this might change. If we looked by age, you'll see that even though the numbers get very small, the case fatality ratios do increase by age. So overall, children might be at slightly less risk of dying from meningococcal disease, although they are at incredible um, increased risk of acquiring meningococcal disease. Um, and if you have patients admitted who are older, who might be immunocompromised and HIV infected, your case fatality ratios increase um, if we look at our data over time. So we did, and this is Susan's work um, as part of her PhD, um, very actively trying to follow up those patients that were admitted to our enhanced surveillance sites. So at our tertiary hospitals where there are surveillance offices, we know they're in hospital um, outcome, but now we wanted to try and follow up there um, after they get discharged, what happens to them? So here, these data were updated data from um, 
2016 onwards, and we looked at, we wanted to see just how many died in hospital. So you'll see it's 12%, slightly lower than the previously, the historical data that we had. Um, and of those, the most important um, clinical syndrome resulting in death was the bacteremia. And this is just the lab definition, but in essence, that's the meningococcal sepsis. That's your patient who presents either with or without meningitis, but clearly has the petechiae, um, the pupura, and has that whole meningococcal sepsis type picture. And 20% of those um, may die um, if we look at our data. 9%, um, so less if they present with only meningitis. So we lumped the meningitis and septicemia together because in fact the septicemia sort of drives the clinical course and drives the outcome. Well, meningitis on its own was about 9%. So keep that in mind. I think also when you see your patients, um, the, the real horrifying pictures are those that present with the petechia, the pupera and have the meningococcal sepsis. So another 3% of survivors that survived the in-hospital um, course um, died within two months post-discharge. So here you have your 12% plus your additional 3% in the red and in the purple here in the pie diagram. And then you have the rest of the individuals who um, have sequelae, so do not, so don't die, not as a direct effect of the vex, um, of the disease. However, have significant sequelae, and we were able to pick up that our rates of sequelae, so of from um, invasive meningococcal disease, were very similar from the, to the international literature. About another fifth, another twenty percent of um, people will um, have um, sequelae. Um, if they survive the episode, which is significant. And the sequelae that we documented were necrotic skin lesions, um, loss of um, small parts of limbs, et cetera, new, set, um, new onset seizures were common, and some neurological fallout, which is difficult. And this wasn't done with um, very careful evaluations. Um, this was done uh, telephonically, trying to get some assessments, um, clinical assessments, but not as carefully done as some sequelae papers and studies have attempted this. However, it does tell us that there is something to be said and for us to care for these patients on an ongoing basis as some of them will have um, long-term sequelae that need to be addressed or need to be, um, be part of their um, chronic care over time. And so these are data from our um, surveillance sites, but not from all of them, and so may also be biased towards the more urban centers um, for disease. So what has happened more recently in South Africa? This is just number of cases from 2018 to 2019 and 2020. 2020 you'll see are in red. 2018, so these are about the 100 to 150 cases we might see throughout the year. You'll see here's the increase in the seasonal. Um, doesn't always, because the numbers are getting so small, doesn't always follow this uh, nice graphs that we used to have when the numbers were bigger. But you'll see very carefully that in 2020, in January, we had a bit more than we would have expected potentially if you look at the last the two years before that. But then we, in fact, saw very little disease um, throughout um, 2020. So the year of COVID, something happened that reduced um, disease rates that we were looking for um, in our surveillance system. So our surveillance system does look at invasive meningococcal disease, which is just assuming that people will have a specimen taken and will have something detected. Um, and I'll talk to that in a moment, but here just to show updated data. So this is now for 2020 run through until the end of the year, almost the end of the year. So week 50, maybe not quite reaching the absolute end of the year, but you'll see that that trend of having much less disease in 2020 in green versus the ones the year in blue, which is 2018 and in 2019 continued. It wasn't like it was just until our, um, that early analysis that we had done. Um, and so clearly something is happening. Um, we had a mixture of serial groups, so it wasn't that. It wasn't like um, a, a serial group had been wiped out. In fact, we had, um, a good mixture of serial groups causing disease in 2019 and 2020, and it was quite similar. 
and an international group called the IRIS group. So at the bottom you'll see IRIS is standing for Invasive Respiratory Infection Surveillance, started early last year as um, the, the pandemic was called and as people started discussing, well, what might happen with other diseases. Um, and this paper, Angela Brueggemann led with the IRIS um, surveillance group um, and has been accepted the Lancet Digital Health and they showed for all these countries, and it's about 26 countries from six continents, um, streptococcus pneumonia decreased. And again, it's the same way of looking at the data. You've got two years prior, those are in the hashed and the dotted lines here for each of these pathogens. And then in 2020, you have the solid line and you'll see that the fall off occurring for streptococcus pneumonia, Haemophilus influenzae, Neisseria meningitidis. Now, these three organisms are all sort of respiratory bacterial pathogens that have a respiratory transmission route. They are carried in the nasopharynx. And the idea is that something must have happened with the non-pharmaceutical interventions, with the lockdowns, with the change in our um, activities in 2020 that resulted in these decreases. As a control group, they used group B strep streptococcus agalactiae. This is here in the last panel. And you'll see no change happened because one could argue that maybe people didn't go to hospital for this type of invasive disease that requires a specimen to be taken. It could have been that people just didn't present to hospitals. But interestingly enough, for group B strep, enough children and adults presented to hospitals to the extent that, that you didn't notice this drop off of disease. And the thought is that this is not a respiratory pathogen, um, group B strep, streptococcus agalactiae, in comparison to the other three that are um, respiratory pathogens. And another way of looking, this is now for South African data, just Neisseria meningitidis. Um, um, overall, in fact, this is the 5,800 from all the different countries, and here's South African data. And looking at the stringency of our um, lockdowns of the non-pharmaceutical inter interventions. What were we doing in the country early on last year when this drop off and here in red you have 2020 happened in South Africa and they try to compare it in each of the 26 countries. They look at these data and they present these data um, to show that it didn't really matter just how stringent, but any versions of this resulted in a drop off. And the thought is there are two possible mechanisms, both that you might have a prior viral infection that then, and we know that viral infections do sometimes to, um, precede meningococcal disease. So by stopping viral transmission, respiratory viral transmission, influenza was very much stopped last year, that you didn't have that subsequent bacterial infection. And the other is that by virtue of the fact that these are also respiratory pathogens, respiratory bacteria, that they just didn't spread at the same time. Um, at this time when so much was being done to, to prevent us from transmitting respiratory pathogens. So we don't know. Um, I think it continued um, the reductions. What is really now important to monitor and wor worry about is what's going to happen in South Africa and in other countries. So we were talking about disease here and I just want to touch upon carriage. Um, that's where the reservoir is. Um, carriage is endemic. Many people carry the organism, but it is higher in adolescents and young adults. Those people going into universities, going into um, training barracks and training schools for police, for the military, etc. cetera. Um, and that's why we think we see um, these increases in disease as well, because carriage increases there. Um, and um, does also result in, in, in disease, although disease is much rarer than the carriage. One point I want to make up, not, as, not much is known about carriage in South Africa. There's not, there's not been many studies at all that we could find. Um, and what we do know in Africa is that carriage is slightly less, um, occurs slightly less commonly, so not as high as the 20% um, that might be seen in university students to 40% in other countries. Um, th this doesn't happen in Africa from what we see. It seems that carriage rates peak more early, so and at a younger age, um, and in general are much lower than those rates that have been described in the United States, in Europe, and Australia. So what we did, um, Susan and her team, and many, I think, um, I think some of you might have been involved at two universities. So at UCT and at WITS in 2017 in the summer, 
So this was when they registered. And in autumn is when it was two months afterwards, we did two cross-sectional prevalence studies trying to follow up the cohort. So the first time round, we had about 1,654 students. We tried um, 55 students. We tried to follow up those. Um, and in fact, this, these analyses are only on those that we could follow up. Um, and that did come back the second time round. We had many more or several more that did um, that were new in the second cohort versus the first cohort. But it's these that show you just what happened to the same individual um, within two months. So 5% were carrying at registration at both UCT and WITS, and that um, it was higher um, at um, UCT than it was at WITS, but overall it was 5% and went up to 8%. So there was a 63% increase in carriage, um, but that is quite low in comparison to what the data show from the UK, for example, where up to 20 to 40 percent um, of individuals will carry after two months um, at university. So it was intriguing that it was so low, and we think that there's not much, and this is described in the um, CID paper that is already available. We don't think it was methodological on our side. It may be because things are different in Africa, and we need to explore carriage more generally, and in South Africa and Africa, and it may be that already quite a few of them were carrying because they, in, the, in 2017, in fact, there had been some protests and there were protests of university students before enrollment and registration started. And so, but we do think that this does reflect at least something of what is happening in South Africa, that there might be lower carriage rates in adolescents um, um, in comparison to maybe younger children um, or other age groups. 5% acquired new carriage over this time, over these two months, about 3% had persistent carriage, about 2% cleared the initial carriage, and 90% um, stayed um, carriage free. So it was interesting, it's much lower than for other countries. What were the risk factors for carriage acquisition for acquiring a meningococcus? Well, it makes sense, it was pub and nightclub attendance, intimate kissing, and in fact, what is new and interesting was there was a low association of about five with high um, confidence intervals. And that's because we had, the numbers were small. The HIV co-infection, in fact, uh, an HIV prevalence in our students was quite low and unexpected. So our sample size didn't quite, um, wasn't quite big enough to look at HIV um, overall or to have tight confidence intervals it did find that there was an associated um, increased adjusted relative risk for HIV infection. So that was a new finding. And again, emphasizes the need for considering HIV infected individuals, maybe HIV infected students, much more seriously for, a, um, for meningococcal vaccination. And we know that this is why we think things might be different because of the age. In South Africa and Africa, it might be different by age in comparison to the UK and the other carriage studies that were done in other universities. And we know that um, crowding, sharing of spaces, the contact with new and different individuals, all the things that are driving the acquisition of meningococcus might be different in different universities um, at different times. Even this year, things will be happening differently to these university students. Well, we did see that within the registration period, it increased quite quickly. So um, this is UCT, you'll see they generally were higher. Um, carriage. WITS is here in um, this um, red um, brown color, and you'll see they had lower overall carriage rates, but both of them had an increase within days of, this is study enrollment, so um, this is during um, registration. So as days passed, these students were kissing, were um, going to pubs, were partying, and carriage rates increased. If we looked at just the first um, cross sectional prevalence study at, um, at these two universities. So just to finish off, here we are in March this year. This is 2017 and 2018 and 2019 was very similar. This is when we start March and April is when we should be preparing ourselves, remembering what meningococcal disease is, how to treat it, um, to keep it in mind because that's when the numbers increase. And so all practices, casualties, GP practices, et cetera, Please remember the clinical presentation and just how, um, uh, how difficult it can be to consider meningococcal disease as part of your differential diagnosis because we expect to see the most cases um, during our winter and spring months. And using antibiotics really quickly, giving antibiotics quickly, um, 
It's known to save lives. It is a notifiable condition. Remember to notify, even if you're just suspecting it. So you see petechiae and pupera, you start antibiotics, no specimen is taken, still notify the individual. We can still do a lot to follow up close contacts of that individual wherever they are and to help prevent any secondary cases. Um, if a specimen is taken, we are talking with the laboratories and with all um, uh, private and public sector laboratories so that they send us um, the meningococcus so we can let you know what the serial group was, especially if subsequently there's um, a cluster of cases. So we clinically suspected, and I think needs to be notified, and that's to remind you all, it is not wrong to notify and for you to find another cause of the clinical presentation. It is in fact the best thing to do, because the one thing you don't want to do is miss notifying. So we'd rather you sometimes over notify that that clinical suspected is a more sensitive case definition, but we'd rather deal with um, giving close contacts at that time, chemoprophylaxis, than only dealing with laboratory confirmed cases. Laboratory confirmed cases will come to us at least 24 hours later um, and it will only be a subset because even some of the meningococcal disease that is true meningococcal disease, we'll not get optimal specimens and the lab will not be able to isolate the organism. So please use clinical suspicion to notify and then you will get all the help of the Department of Health, of the, the CDCCs, the Communicable Disease Coordinators. They will go into the households, the schools, the nursery um, schools to check for contacts and to give chemoprophylaxis. So it really takes a load off the clinical staff in the hospital or in the GP practice if they notify timelessly because the Department of Health will take over and deal with chemoprophylaxis. Um, for the close contacts. And generally, healthcare workers who didn't get wet, who didn't either intubate the patient, weren't part of taking, um, sitting in front of the patient while the lumbar puncture was being done, who somehow weren't closely involved, they don't need to get chemoprophylaxis. I know it's difficult to convince those staff, especially, I think we're all very anxious at these times, um, but we often advocate that only those that got wet who were exposed to respiratory droplets should get chemoprophylaxis. And so finally, how can we prevent this disease? Vaccines are based both on the polysaccharide capsule or not on the capsule, so rather the outer membrane vesicles or recombinant proteins um, and a combination of that. And I've just mentioned the ones that I think are important for us in South Africa. Vexera and Remember are the two non-capsular vaccines that are now available overseas and hopefully in the next months and years will be registered here in South Africa. While the polysaccharide protein conjugate vaccine is the second generation vaccines that are also based on the polysaccharide but are conjugated to a protein and give you much better immune responses and especially give you better immune responses in children. And the polysaccharide vaccine is the older generation, the first generation vaccine, which is still useful and can still be used, um, but is most importantly useful for um, adults. And you need to think of hyper-responsiveness. So if you need to give it multiple times, that the second or third time you give a polysaccharide vaccine, you get a dampened um, immune response. So here, the repeated dosing for immunological hyperresponsiveness, that's for the polysaccharide vaccine. It's a T cell independent response, which doesn't give you the booster um, res uh, response that we would like, and it doesn't give you a response in toddlers and infants. And while the polysaccharide protein vaccine is a T cell dependent response and really works in infants, gives you a booster response. And in fact, one of its big, um, characteristics that also results in herd protection because acquisition of the serogroups that are in the vaccine is prevented and these individuals they no longer transmit, those that are vaccinated no longer transmit. But this herd protection is most important when the vaccine is used routinely. So in South Africa, this wouldn't make much difference at the moment, except there might be some cocooning in families of people being vaccinated. But otherwise, the herd um, protection or herd effect that has been seen elsewhere in the world has been as a result of routine immunization with meningococcal vaccines. So it's a very, they're very successful, these vaccines, um, resulting in prevention of disease and elimination of carriage and used all over the world, in the UK, in Europe, in the United States, and recently in the last 
um, five, six years very successfully with the Menafrivac vaccine, the monovalent polysaccharide protein conjugate vaccine that's used in the meningitis belt and is now being introduced. It was introduced as a once-off vaccine dose and now is hopefully being introduced um, as part of the routine immunization so that there's ongoing benefits for the African meningitis belt communities. Um, there are multiple products available. And I think for you, just simply, if someone is telling you about a meningococcal vaccine, ask them whether it's a polysaccharide, polysaccharide protein conjugate vaccine, or one of the, the serial group B will always be the non-capsular where there's um, other antigens that are in it. Um, because serial group B, in fact, the, the polysaccharide of serial group B is an auto antigen. It's an antigen that our bodies recognize, and therefore there's real concerns about using polysaccharide for serogroup B, and that's why those other non-polysaccharide vaccines um, protect against serogroup B disease. Just ask which ones are, are these vaccines and what are they? Are they the monovalent, the bivalent, the trivalent, or the um, quadrivalent? Because there's so many um, different valencies um, available throughout the world, and with travelers and people coming into this country, et cetera, you have to ask more, for more details to know which vaccine was used. We're staged at moderate risk category as far as SAGE, which is this group of experts commissioned by the World Health Organization. I still think it's very important for us to consider at-risk communities in South Africa, even if we will not and do not start routine immunization anytime soon. Um, and we are meant to prioritize or at least consider meningococcal vaccination in our communities, but we also have many other priorities in South Africa. So we acknowledge that it's not routinely offered. Maybe about 6,000 doses of meningococcal vaccine are sold every year, and most of those are used um, in the private sector, used for travelers, for Hajj pilgrims, etc. So a whole range of individuals that are vaccinated. And we have published recommendations for meningococcal vaccination in South Africa. Um, and you'll um, recognize that the serogroups um, are important when you start thinking about it. So ideally, we need a serogroup B vaccine because I showed you that serogroup B is really the most prevalent serogroup in South Africa more recently. The other serogroups are important, and I would still give the vaccine um, that cover other serogroups. So this is recommended. These people should ideally get um, the vaccine. Laboratory workers who work with high volumes, not just with diagnostic specimens, but high volumes um, and volumes of meningococcus that can be aerosolized. That's in research labs, in vaccine producing laboratories. Travelers who go to the meningitis belt or hyperendemic areas, if there are outbreaks, and nowadays it, doesn't be, it isn't necessarily recommended for all travelers to these areas because things have changed so much with the meningococcal vaccination in, for example, the meningitis belt, and then those at high risk um, of acquiring infection. So we've got the complement um, component deficiencies, um, anatomical or functional asplenias, and I think these are currently um, being used um, um, routinely in South Africa. One um, group of people where it's mandatory is the Hajj pilgrims. So they're going into a place where there may not be an outbreak, but because of the pilgrimage and because of the way it's constituted, there could be an outbreak if they were not vaccinated. And so for travelers going into going to Hajj, um, going to going for the Hajj pilgrimage, that is um, a requirement and everyone needs to, they need to in fact show that they've received the vaccine. We should be considering um, the vaccine and here just to remind you HIV infection, we had discussed healthy adolescents and young adults entering university college, especially HIV infected university students. I would definitely consider offering them the quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine. Yes, military recruits, training or deployment, minors used to be a very important risk group in South Africa, but depending on how they're living and where they're working, it would be um, it's important to consider them as a group that might benefit from meningococcal vaccination and then other immunocompromising conditions. Attendees of mass gatherings to consider that, um, for example, like young individuals, um, older adolescents and young adults who go for things like um, training rugby um, world cups or um, training workshops um, scout jamborees etc consider if you hear if people come to you they're going on these tra um, traveling excursions etc 
consider them because in some ways they are mass gatherings. They are young people most likely going to carry, bringing it from all over the world, and they may be at increased risk. And if it's possible and affordable, um, it should be considered for these groups. So in summary, I just wanted to discuss the decreasing incidence rates in South Africa, the fact that in fact we saw very little disease in 2020, um, but we need to be prepared because the season should be starting and if it, flu and other diseases or anything to go by, respiratory infections should come up again. Um, but in South Africa, HIV is a risk factor for disease um, and should be considered as one of the reasons for preferential risk group vaccination. That we still have many unknowns as far as carriage data is in South Africa, trying to understand what is going on, but we're trying to do more and more work to try and see if we can understand more about South African meningococcal carriage. Um, and um, I'm finishing off with this slide in the sense that meningitis and meningococcal disease is a real priority um, globally. And in fact, there's a global WHO vision of a 2030 action plan trying to eliminate at least meningitis epidemics and outbreaks and reduce the disability um, and cases and death from meningitis and of the most important causes are meningococcal um, Neisseria meningitidis. And in order to have the data for South Africa and even the research studies that we've done, there's a large team of people that I need to thank, um, our surveillance networks throughout the country. And many of you may be involved, have sent us specimens, um, have sent us better clinical data when we phoned, and I'd like to thank you, as well as our whole surveillance network. And I'm going to stop sharing, so hopefully there's still some time to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. That's incredible and really nice overview. And, and thanks for all the good local data too, because that's, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, it's hard to find sometimes, but it's 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 of huge importance to us and, and especially with winter coming. Um, I've, I've been sent a, a bunch of questions, some on the Q&A, some in text messages, some on, on chat. So I'm just going to go through some of them. Um, one of the things was the, the the sort of the seasonality of it, so the winter, spring. Is that just because you think people are indoors and in closer contact with each other, or, or is there something else to it? Um, I think it's partly that. It's a respiratory, the fact that it spreads more easily and people are clustering together. It's also viral infections. Um, we know that flu and some mycoplasma and other diseases may precede meningococcal disease. Um, and so it's a combination of things that happen to us in winter. And we can see some things that we didn't do last year, for example. Over. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Uh, Lucille in the chat was making a good point about the, you know, the NPIs that, that presumably led to such a, a decline, you know, also included the fact that many universities and colleges were closed, uh, and there's a lot of online learning and nightclubs were closed as well. So a bunch of things obviously all joining together. It's pretty dramatic data. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's you know, that's, that's uh, that, that shift of the curve across many countries is, is really quite telling. Absolutely, and I think we'll still be looking at these data for the next few years. I mean, 2020 will be the year, and I think 2021 will have some data from other countries where they still had lockdowns. Where can they see whether they continue the trajectory, and we'll be able to see what happens to us without any other of those interventions. Maybe the universities, there'll be still less, there'll be more online learning, but schools are opening and other economic activities are opening. So I think we'll be chewing on these data for a few more years to fully understand what really happened. But I agree that it's all those interventions that were important. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, oh, someone put up their hand and put it down. So if, if you do have a question you'd like to ask rather than type, so either type it in the chat, but if you want to ask, just stick up your hand and I'll, I'll unmute you. You're welcome to, to ask questions that way. Um, some of the other questions were, um, uh, just looking at three. Oh yes, why why the particular sero group uh, changes over time? I mean, do we, do, is it is it random or is there some sort of selective advantage to certain serotypes in certain circumstances? Like you know, wh why does why come and go, but C you know remain different or B you know is is it is there something intrinsic to the to it or is it just sort of founder effect and randomness? There's something, there is something intrinsic and there must be a founder effect. So I think that double a zero group W, when it came in, it was a founder effect. It was a pandemic that came down from um, throughout um, 
it was in Africa, et cetera. And so there was a founder effect of the Seal Group W reaching South Africa and then having to spread in South Africa. So in and of itself, it may not have had such a, an advantage except at Serial Group. And then we needed to create immunity to that Serial Group. So um, I think there's an element of both intrinsic um, uh, advantage that some of these strains, but then that, these, that, that could be is irrespective of the Serial Group. And then sometimes it's the introduction of a new Serial Group, a new strain that results in it being able to spread and then to um, cause clusters. And when we look at our data, the 2019 paper, 2019 paper from Susan showed, in fact, there were a few clusters that we didn't detect, that we didn't know about. And in fact, different serial groups and different strains coming into the community, um, causing increased disease over time and then fading away. And so it's a mixture. And I think it's it, what is strong is taking specimens and for us to have some serial group data and slowly for us to understand more carefully what is happening in South Africa and to be able to tell you when things change, if we have enough data and there's enough specimens that have come our way, um, what we think might be happening. I think that's the important strength in case there is an increase um, in the future. Fascinating. Um, Sharon, you've, you've got your hand up. Um, do you want to, do you want to let us know you should be able to unmute yourself at this point. Uh, Sharon Pitts, are you able to unmute? Or maybe not. Oh, there we are. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead, Sharon. Okay. I see it. it it may be, so I think we're having some difficulties, but Sharon's also, I just see typed a thing as well. Um, doses of penicillin and Keftrax in a stat doses before transfer. So I assume she's meaning, you know, in, when meningococcal disease is, uh, is expected, would you recommend that prior to transfer to, to a regional or tertiary hospital? Absolutely. I think that's a general recommendation. I think, Jeremy, you'll know, I think um, every minute counts. And I think if um, if you suspect and if it's sort of a very nonspecific hypertensive sort of shock-like picture and you're thinking this could be, um, I think everything points to the fact that um, when we're in the season and um, when meningococcal disease is suspected to start treatment as soon as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Eunice is asking a very good question. She says, if, if, what if you find, an inc incidentally, you find a culture from the oropharynx that's positive for meningococcus? Should you eradicate that or treat the contact, uh, contacts? Or how, how do you approach it if you, if you happen to culture it from the pharynx incidentally? So incidentally, it's only carriage, and no, I wouldn't do anything if it was only the theoretical question, but it really depends on who you found it on, and if that person knows, and if you now know, and everyone else knows, and we've found that although you've just detected carriage, and therefore you shouldn't do anything, in fact, that organism is now resulting in an immune response, it's doing exactly the right thing in that individual um, it more than likely, um, if you were to treat, you're only increasing the possibilities of resistance um, of that strain then being transmitted to other family members, et cetera. Um, so theoretically, we know that we shouldn't be treating, you shouldn't eradicate it, you should leave it alone. But we know that also deal with the individuals that you are working with. Um, um, there are all sorts of scenarios that we've dealt with over the years. Um, breastfeeding mothers where it's been found incidentally, um, people who um, are working with neonates in, in, in um, neonatal ICU. And I think so find out what you what is the information that you have um, and then make a decision, knowing that sometimes we do do things that aren't theoretically indicated. Over. No, that's, that's a great point. As you say, there's so much panic around it half the time as well, which, which um, messes it all up. And then, you know, this, this concept of the meningitis belts, I mean, you know, the, I think most people probably know what it is, but I mean, it's a sort of band in sub-Saharan Africa and the sub-Saharan region, but, but it's, as you said, I mean, the, the incidence there is just astronomical. Why, why is that? I mean, what, what do we think drives such a high incidence in that region and not elsewhere in, in other areas? People don't know. There's lots of ideas and hypotheses, and one of them is it's sub-Saharan, so it's just the belt below the Sahara Desert, um, and it, it really reaches from the west coast to the east coast in Africa, so that whole um, belt below the Sahara. There's some thought that it might be the, the, the dust, the dryness, the seasons, the way people live um, and have to deal with the warm winds that come um, and uh, bring all this dust and that the dust might excoriate or create injuries on in the nasopharynx. So if you're carrying, you might be at increased risk. 
Those are some of the hypotheses. It's not really known. One good news story is that with the meningococcal vaccination, um, in fact, they've had very only very few isolated outbreaks and outbreaks not due to serogroup A, because serogroup A was also the predominant serogroup um, in the meningitis belt, but not the only serogroup causing disease. So unfortunately, there are no real easy answers to why. Um, and it, I think it was a mixture of host and pathogen and environment um, that resulted and does result in these high incidence rates there. Yeah, fascinating. And, and thank goodness, as you say, we're finally getting a, a hold on that in terms of the incidence. And then last question, but uh, uh, is, is about this, why it's not in the EPI. So is it just a sort of cost effective analysis you know, based on the fact that we don't have a hugely high incidence in this country or, or is there some other aspect to it? No, I think it is that. I think it's a rare disease. Remember, the conjugate vaccines have only been made available in the last 10, 15 years. So pre prior to that, it was the polysaccharide vaccine, and that wouldn't have done anything for the disease rates in infants and children. Um, I think it is, it's a rare disease in South Africa. It's a very expensive vaccine, the conjugate vaccine, and in the future, the serogroup B vaccine, which would be of the, the important one to have in our routine immunization program. So you would need to have a mixture of those two vaccines. Um, would make it very, very expensive. And I think there are so many other priorities in South Africa. So it's this balancing act, act um, of judging um, what other vaccines would be more important in our communities, um, amongst children, among, amongst adolescents. And we know that other vaccines have been introduced, other expensive vaccines, but we believe that those vaccines obviously um, have a much bigger impact for the whole population rather than the few cases that meningococcal disease vaccines um, would prevent, which is why I think we're trying to really recommend um, as the last um, sort of is to think of which risk groups could you try and vaccinate in South Africa where it's not a routine immunization, but where we're trying to target those that we think might be at highest risk and have higher rates of disease than the general population. Over. Great. Thank you so much, and for your time. This is an incredibly useful talk, and thank you so much for sharing both your expertise and your time. Oh, I see someone has typed, oh, Eunice has typed in one question, if you don't mind, and sorry. Uh, she said, uh, just, uh, since incidence is highest in under one years of age, would you recommend vaccinating pregnant mothers? So is there, is there a sort of passive transfer of immunity here that would help? There's, it's been explored a little, um, passive um, transfer, but it's almost like it's not, um, the vaccine and using the vaccine in pregnant women, it's not a standard practice. Um, and the thought is that hopefully um, those children that are at risk, if we were to immunize as part of uh, an immunization program, they would be protected by the indirect effect. So similarly in the way that in pneumococcal disease, neonates were prevented or prevent, uh, protected from neonatal pneumococcal disease because the children that received it as part of the routine immunization program at, at a slightly older age group were no longer carrying. And I think that's where we would like to have the most impact. So, and that's where the impact has been shown in the UK, for example, that the herd effect of immunizing, in fact, they immunized all until 19 years of age. And they showed that those that were too young to be immunized were protected and those older, um, too old to be immunized were protected. And I think that's the strategy we should be considering in South Africa. Over. Fascinating. All right. Well, thank you again so much. It's an absolute privilege to hear from you. And thank you so much for sharing all the knowledge you have. You, you told me before that you hadn't thought of meningococcus for a while. It's just totally untrue. You're a pro at this. And thank you very much for, for, hand, for giving us such a great talk today. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity and for all your time. And goodbye. Bye-bye.